Gliders, or sailplanes, are conventional aircraft with wings, a tailplane and fin. You sit inside them and are sheltered from the elements. The only fundamental difference with a normal aeroplane is the lack of an engine. However, even that isn't always true. Inside, there's the standard controls for the three axes of movement. A stick for controlling the flying attitude, as well as for banking left and right. And in the footwells, you have rudder pedals for affecting the yaw of the aircraft. From the outside, you'll see control surfaces moving like they would on any Boeing or Airbus. However, gliders typically don't have flaps. To lose height at a safe speed, particularly on final approach, you open the air brakes, paddles which protrude above and sometimes below the wings. Without them, a glider would just fly on and on. Even a low-performance glider can cover 5 miles whilst descending 1,000 feet. The instruments are also very similar to those found in powered aircraft. There's an airspeed indicator, an altimeter and a compass. The all-important vertical speed indicator, or variometer, shows if the glider is gaining or losing height, and the slip ball shows if it's being flown in a coordinated way. Though keeping a lookout is important in all types of flying, it's even more crucial in gliding, as gliders often congregate either whilst thermaling or in the circuit. For this reason, the variometer is fitted with a speaker and bleeps at varying tones to tell us if we're climbing or sinking steeply. Less high-tech is the simple piece of string attached to the canopy front. This tells us whether we're in coordinated flight and whether we should add or reduce rudder inputs. As a general rule, you want the string to be lying in the middle. And how do we launch gliders? There are two principal methods. The first is an aerotow, where a relatively powerful tug plane tows the glider to where the glider pilot would like to be released. Towing is good for reaching any height desired and being taken to an area of good lift. However, it's more expensive. The aerotow is tricky to perform at first, but satisfying when you do it well. First of all, you need to keep the glider balanced on its centre wheel during the ground run. Then you hold it a couple of feet above the runway whilst the tug gets airborne. Once both of you are in the air, you follow the tug aircraft carefully. For five minutes you're participating in formation flying. An alternative launch method is winching, where a large machine rapidly winds in a kilometre or so of cable. The glider, which is attached to the other end, climbs at an angle of approximately 45 degrees like a kite. Winching is much cheaper, though flights are shorter. However, it's very practical when learning, because you can carry out more launches and therefore more circuit and landing practice. Depending on the winch vehicle, airfield size and weather conditions, a winch launch will get you to 1 to 2,000 feet in barely 30 seconds. It's also exhilarating, with peak climb rates of around 3,000 feet per minute. Once up in the air, the aim is generally to find lift and stay up for as long as possible. Gliders are always descending within the parcel of air in which they're flying. The solution is to find a parcel of air which is rising at a faster rate than the glider is descending, and so be carried upwards with it. It's a bit like walking down an escalator which is moving in the opposite direction. If the stairs are going upwards quicker than you're walking down, you'll be carried higher and higher. Where I fly in the flat vale of York, thermals are the most common source of lift. A thermal is formed when air at the surface becomes considerably warmer than the surrounding air and begins to rise. The presence of cumulus type clouds are a good indicator of this instability and attract gliders. The more experienced and keener ride pilots also look for birds circling in thermals and head over in their direction or look for thermal triggers on the ground, such as a farmer ploughing fields. Action like this can trigger the release of pockets of air which have been warming up close to the ground. 
Other sources of rising air used by glider pilots depend on local and regional geography. Clubs that are adjacent to hills and mountains benefit from ridge lift, where wind blows onto the slope and is deflected upwards. By placing the glider in the updraft, you can fly along the length of the ridge, being pushed upwards like a surfer. A similar surfing action occurs when gliders get into mountain wave. This is where wind hits a range of hills or mountains, causing an up and down wave motion in the atmosphere, which can continue for tens or even hundreds of miles downstream. So if you fancied giving it a go, what should you do? In the UK, gliding is quite well developed with a large number of clubs across the country. The activity is self-regulated through the British Gliding Association, which works closely with grassroots flying, though does so with the authority of the CAA. In Yorkshire alone, there are four clubs. I'm based at York Gliding Centre in the village of Ruffeth, west of York. Nationwide, there are over 80 sites. Most will offer trial flights during which the instructor will hand over the controls and allow you to fly the glider. These experience vouchers typically include extended membership, allowing you to try again at members' rates for a further period, such as three months. And how long does it take to learn and go solo? And actually, this depends on age, natural ability, and how intensively you pursue it. My training was primarily via winch launches and I soloed on my 93rd launch, which was pretty much standard. This took a year and I went to the club on average two to three times per month. In the UK, you can simply go solo and just enjoy local flying, authorised by your club instructors. No licence is required and there's no medical to pass, just a self-declaration of fitness. However, if you wish to push on, the first stage is to polish up your skills, demonstrate them to an instructor across several flights and sit a theory paper which isn't dissimilar in content to that in the PPL exams. Pass this and you'll have the bronze badge. Then you demonstrate your ability to stay up for at least two hours and to navigate a predetermined route. Now you'll have a glider licence which will be recognised in other countries. Maybe you'll want to enter competitions individually or as a team where you attempt to complete a set route or as much of it as possible in as short a time as possible. Or, if you have the constitution, what about aerobatics, either just for fun or within competitions? Gliding offers this too. Here we can see manoeuvres performed by Benji Ambler. Benji went solo on his 14th birthday in 2016 and, within a couple of years, he progressed to a PPL and was performing aerobatics competitively. In fact, we all perform aerobatics of sorts as part of our basic glider training. Before we can fly solo, we learn how we might accidentally enter a spin, recognise it and get out of it. As glider pilots, we have to do spin checks annually. And it is something I enjoy doing, though I'm happy to admit that this wasn't my feeling at the beginning. To call it an unusual attitude is something of an understatement. Here, Andy Marvin, an instructor at York Gliding Centre, is demonstrating the entrance into and exit from a spin. So, who are my fellow glider pilots? They're regular people from all walks of life. In our clubs we have current and former airline and forces pilots, though they're only a small minority. We're just regular people who enjoy gliding, though a good number are real enthusiasts about aviation in general. And gliding is a very social activity. Most clubs are voluntary organisations, meaning that the instructor, the tug pilots, winch operator and even the person cutting the grass, they're all doing it for the love of it and they want to put something back. Unlike powered flying, where often you book your slot, turn up and get the plane out by yourself, fly and then put it away again, gliding is a team activity. You come along for a few hours, you muck in and you keep each other safe. Without my fellow club members, I can't fly. And without me, neither can they. So what do you think? Interested? If so, go to the BGA website if you're in the UK, or look for your national federation if you live elsewhere, and find a club near you.